Hi class. Uh, so today we're going to talk about life on Earth for one of the last times. Uh, we're getting ready to start talking about the search for life in the solar system. So we're going to talk about the last kind of life that we see here on Earth that's going to inform uh, the way we go looking for life when we start leaping to other worlds. So uh, what that means next week is we're going to start talking about the solar system. Uh, Monday we're going to have a math day. Let's call it a math day. It's going to be a physics day, but uh, we're going to talk about orbits and we're going to talk about gravity uh, so that we can describe the conditions uh, under which life is going to find itself on other worlds. So for those of you who need a little bit of a math refresher, you should go look at our early math videos that we put up the first week. Uh, we won't do too much math uh, next week, but uh, we are going to talk a little bit um, of, about algebra and stuff like that. So just uh, make sure you get uh, the refreshers uh, in place if you feel like they need them and Monday we'll uh, have a little chat, okay? So today we're gonna talk about life at the extreme. Uh, so extreme forms of life are uh, life on earth that survives in unusual environments. And so that is something that is potentially very interesting, very important when we start looking elsewhere in the cosmos, because uh, certainly for us as humans and as most of our colleague life forms here on planet Earth, most places besides Earth are very extreme. So uh, we'd like to understand what it takes to uh, not survive in the comfort of our own ordinary lives. So in the picture behind me here, uh, this is Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, those of you who have been there, you know about this. It's in the Midway Geyser Basin, which isn't too far from Old Faithful. Uh, this is about the view of the spring that you have from the boardwalk. Uh, you can see some of the colors that show here. And one of the things we're going to show today is a picture of the spring from overhead. Um, it's probably one of the most beautiful features in Yellowstone National Park. It's quite startling to people who haven't seen it before. Those colors really are real. Uh, this is very typical of what it looks like uh, when you see it from uh, normal ground level. Uh, it's a very enormous feature, uh, but you can see here there's uh, algae and stuff growing in the spring. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay? So let me start a couple of slides. Um, okay, so uh, this is not in Yellowstone, actually. This is known as Fly Geyser. So if you're ever in Nevada, this is north of Reno, uh, out in the Black Rock Desert. So if you ever get a chance to go there uh, and see it, you uh, will see uh, this particular geyser. Um, this is not a natural geyser. This is a geyser that was created by humans, basically. Uh, they were drilling for water there in that area of uh, Nevada, because it's a desert. Uh, and down about 200 feet or so, they hit a geothermal feature, uh, which caused the water from uh, the aquifer to come erupting up, and over the years, uh, it has created this geyser structure. So the thing to notice here, the reason uh, this is here for a picture, and we'll come back to this later on, is once again, you see the very colorful uh, algae uh, that's blooming here on this geyser. And that's uh, part, of the, uh, part of the living at the extreme that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so we're going to talk, uh, we'll start just by talking about environmental adaptation. That's something we talked about before, but I want to ma uh, make a very specific point and point directly at it. Uh, we'll talk about life in extreme environments, um, and then we'll talk about what the implications are for researchers out in the cosmos. So you'll remember that we said natural selection and evolution by adaptation is the uh, uh, prevalence of traits that help you survive in a given environment. Okay, so if you are living somewhere and your life is endangered uh, by something in the environment, maybe it's predators, maybe it's some feature of the environment, uh, who knows what, uh, then any traits that help you overcome that threat enhance your survivability, okay? And those traits can be both physical or they can be behavioral. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 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 just kind of phys physiology or morphology or, or something about your body. It can also be behavioral traits. And behavioral traits are things that some life forms uh, uh, exploit um, and other life forms don't, but they can be, they can be either. 
Um, traits that are no longer advantageous don't simply disappear. So if your species develops some trait that helps it survive uh, through its current environment or because of some, something that's there in the environment, but then over time the situation changes. Maybe the environment changes. Maybe the Earth emerged from an ice age or maybe your situation as a species changed, okay? Um, then the features that you developed for survival, they don't just disappear because you're no longer threatened or you no longer need them for survival, they often persist. Um, and so if they do persist, they often become what are called vestigial. Uh, they're there just because at some point in your species history you had to have them, but today there's no reason to keep them or get rid of them, so they just kind of continue to propagate through your genetics. Okay, so your appendix is a classic example of this. This is often pointed at as being something that early on in the development of our digestive tract, you needed your appendix. As our digestive tracts have evolved, the appendix has become less necessary. So if you've had an appendectomy, then you no longer have an appendix, but you're surviving just fine. Okay, uh, that's not to say that vestigial uh, uh, features in, uh, in species don't um, have uses. Uh, your appendix, for instance, down at the end of your uh, GI tract there um, is a place where um, helpful bacteria in your gut may, may harbor. And if we take it out, you still have helpful get bacteria in your gut, but it's not necessarily a place where uh, they, can, they can shelter in place, as it were. Okay? Okay. So um, as an example of that, uh, we can think about your brains, right? So we often think of our brains as being a uh, prime survival trait. They're something that humans have developed and we've exploited to our advantage to help us survive in the uh, kind of wide, harsh world. Um, there are many ways you could argue that your brain has helped you survive, um, but uh, I think like in the modern age in particular, it's very clear that our brains help us survive because we use our brains as a tool to help us figure out how to manipulate the environment to our advantage. It helps us build houses around us to protect ourselves from the elements. It helps us decide to learn how to farm so that we can produce enough food to support the entire species and so on. Okay, it is clear, however, that that is not always an advantageous trait. Okay, so this is my favorite example of this. Suppose I wanted to invent a shark bite suit, okay? And this has been done. Here's a chainmail suit of armor you can buy for $7,500. And some poor dude had to test this. So we handed it to some fella and said, okay, jump in this pool of sharks and you tell us if it hurts when they bite you. Okay, so that doesn't really seem like your brain there was helping you do a survivability thing. Maybe the creation of the chainmail armor was, but convincing your buddy to jump in and test it, maybe, maybe that wasn't such a good thing. So, okay. But seriously, let's talk about adaptations that are to your advantage. So um, let's think about prey animals, okay? So predation adaptations are adaptations that, uh, that your species has developed to help you survive being eaten by other species, okay? So here are just two classic examples of that. Um, on the left here are called pill bugs or uh, when I was growing up, we called these roly-polies. Uh, they're basically little segmented black bugs. They roll up into something that's just kind of a quarter inch across or so. Um, we call them bugs, but they aren't actually bugs. They're actually land-based uh, relatives of crustaceans. Okay, so they have these armored segmented bodies. So they have a very hard shell that protects them from uh, external threats. Uh, so that's a physical trait that they've developed. But then the uh, behavioral trait is if you poke a roly-poly, then they roll up into this perfect little ball here protecting uh, their entire body as much as they can. Okay, we see that kind of trait all over. So uh, those of you who are from the American Southwest, armadillos do the same thing, okay? Uh, on the right here, you see another uh, trait. Uh, so this is called camouflage. Lots of creatures have discovered camouflage, and the camouflage is often, uh, is often, is always adapted to the local environment the life form finds itself in. So this is a camouflage frog. You can see it sitting there um, against the uh, background and blends in quite well. And so that makes it basically harder for predators to find you, okay? Okay, now prey, uh, certainly adapt to keep themselves from being eaten, but predators themselves also adapt to make them more successful at catching things to be eaten. Okay, so here you see two examples. Uh, so these are both from the Arctic. So on the left there, uh, you see the Arctic fox. 
So they've uh, used the camouflage adaptation that in the last slide for the frog was protecting the frog from being eaten by, you know, herons or, uh, or cranes or something. Uh, in this case, the camouflage of the fox allows it to blend into the background so the things that it's hunting don't see it coming. Okay, um, so uh, that is an adaptation that's been used for a completely different purpose, but it's to the Arctic fox's uh, advantage to not be seen and it allows it to survive. Polar bears are another example, and so over the time, they've, uh, they've adapted many things that allow them to survive in the Arctic. Polar bears live mostly on the pack ice, so uh, if you go uh, here in North America, the easiest place to see the polar bears uh, is in uh, Manitoba uh, on Hudson Bay. Uh, so in the winter, the polar bears go from land where they've been denning out onto the pack ice, and they live on the pack ice during the winter, and their primary source of food is seal. They eat seal, it's very high fat, uh, and it builds up in their bodies. So what you see here for the polar bear um, is look at that long neck the polar bears have. Okay, so that's uh, different than the kinds of bears you see like on uh, grizzly bears or black bears. They have those very long necks, um, and that's an adaptation that has grown into the polar bear species because polar bears that have super long necks can sit on the pack ice near a breathing hole for a seal, and then when a seal pokes up, they can stick their head down in that breathing hole and haul the seal out on the ice. So that long neck lets them reach down into those breathing holes. Okay, so those are adaptations, uh, and there are many other adaptations. You can look at any predator species, any uh, prey species that you want, but they've adapted to the particulars of their environment, and each of these adaptations are things that natural selection has identified as being things that help them survive, okay? Now, we see uh, adaptation in extreme environments. So uh, before I moved to Chicago, um, I was a professor in Utah for about seven years. So uh, this is the Great Salt Lake, that's Antelope Island there. Um, it, the Great Salt Lake is one of the most salinic uh, bodies of water on the planet. Um, on average, the lake's only about 16 feet deep and it has no outlet. Uh, so all the water that comes down, uh, it concentrates in this little tiny area, and it has an extremely high salinity. So if you were to take a liter of water and evaporate it away and keep all the solids, you have about uh, a quarter of a kilogram of solids left. So that's about half a pound of salts uh, dissolved in each liter of water. It's very salinic. Um, so there is not much that lives in the Salt Lake. Uh, there certainly are birds and things like that uh, that exist on the shorelines. Uh, there's a species of flies called brine flies uh, that live in the area. But in the water itself, uh, mostly there's only algae, and we'll talk a little bit about algae and cyanobacteria in a minute and surviving in extreme environments. Uh, but there's mostly these things that you see here on the right. So these are called brine shrimp. Uh, those of you who uh, grew up in the United States, you may have encountered them as kids. They're called sea monkeys as well. You get little packets of them on Christmas and you can grow them at home. Uh, but they are little small micro, uh, microscopic. Uh, they're, not, they're not terribly microscopic, you can see them, but they're shrimp. Uh, and they grow in the Great Salt Lake. And so they have adapted to the extremely high salinity and uh, no other animal has. And so there's a variety of adaptations they have, but two primary ones are they have an extremely hard outer shell, so that prevents them from absorbing water directly into their bodies the way you and I might if we just like hung out in the pool, okay? Uh, but then they have another adaptation, which is the water that they do ingest, they only ingest during feeding, okay? And when that water goes into their body, uh, it goes to their stomach lining, their stomach lining is very efficient about separating the salt out of the water. So it separates all the salt out rather than digesting it and then having it go into their bloodstream. And then they expulse all that salt out through their gills, okay? So, uh, so this is the way the brine ship have adapted and nothing else has. And so they exist in just droves and droves uh, in the Great Salt Lake, so much so that they're uh, harvested uh, on an annual basis as a natural resource. They're used in fish food and, and stuff like that. But now, the uh, um, uh, brine shrimp have to survive on something, and so they feed on the algae uh, that have also adapted to that high salt environment. So what uh, happens uh, in Utah in the spring is the brine shrimp have been dormant all winter, or uh, uh, they're in that phase of their life cycle, and so the algae blooms, and so the Great Salt Lake kind of changes colors uh, in the spring, but as soon as the brine shrimp pop back up, then they start eating all that algae bloom. So it's this kind of interesting cycle 
of uh, survival where the two of them uh, depend on each other. Okay? Yeah. Here is uh, another example. So as promised, this is the Grand Prismatic Spring. <clears throat> this is the view of the Grand Prismatic Spring from above. So in the upper left corner there, you'll see the boardwalk. So that gives you a sense of scale. So the picture there here behind me um, is taken from that boardwalk you see there on the uh, upper left, looking out across the spring. So the whole spring is about 110, 115 meters across. Uh, in the center, it's about 50 meters deep. And so what this is, is this is like all the uh, thermal hot springs in Yellowstone down in the center. Uh, it goes down near to some uh, geo geothermal source of heat. It heats the water, the water rises up. Okay, so this does, this is not like a geyser, this is just a pool, so the water is constantly heated and rising up. It uh, rises to the surface, spreads out toward the edges as it cools, and then as it runs over the edges, which up there near the top, it runs towards the boardwalk and down the hill to the Yellowstone River, uh, is the direction that it flows away from the spring. And you can see all the outlets from the spring there as it's flowing away. Okay, so the thing is, is the water is at its hottest near the center. So when it first comes up, uh, it's very nearly boiling in temperature. Uh, it's about 190 degrees, I guess, at the center. But as the water spreads out across the spring uh, and gets farther from that source of heat, it cools. And so you get these uh, bands of temperature that slowly decrease as you move outward across the spring. Okay, and the color here then is a consequence of the fact that in the different bands of temperature, different cyanobacteria are capable of surviving. Okay, so in the center where it's the hottest, uh, there really isn't much. Okay, and so the blue color you see there in the center um, is the typical blue, pardon me, typical blue color that you see uh, like in a swimming pool or a lake. It's just, it's the blue, blue color of water. Okay, but the first band, the yellow band there, uh, is dominated by a cyanobacteria called Senecococcus. Um, it's all, it's the yellow and the green band in this picture. So the green here is where the yellow is mixing with the blue color of the water, right? Which is a cool physics effect. But uh, Senecococcus and other bacteria that thrive in the same environment as it um, uh, survive once the water temperature is right around 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and they're very specific to that temperature, right? They like the temperature to be right around there. If it gets too much hotter, it kills them. If it gets too much colder, then, then they don't survive either. Okay, and so you see this very narrow band that goes completely around the spring where the temperature is prime for this kind of cyanobacteria. As you move outward, okay, you get into the orange regions and there are, there, in all of these bands, there's quite a few different cyanobacteria. These are just some of the dominant ones that you uh, encounter. So in the orange bands, the dominant one is one called formidium. So formidium thrives when the temperature is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so, so that's just that's barely a 25 degree temperature difference between the yellow band and the orange band. But it's enough of a temperature difference that it completely changes the environment. So some algae can survive and other algae can't, okay? And so you can guess where this story is going. So from the orange regions, it gets, uh, turns into uh, these brown regions. And these brown regions are about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that kind of is lukewarm to your skin when you touch it. Um, so that is uh, dominated by a species known as Colothrex. And uh, it will survive and only be comfortable down to maybe 90 degrees or so. Um, and then it becomes kind of ordinary everyday temperatures uh, and the algae start to uh, blend into the normal sorts of stuff that you find in ponds and stuff as you get farther away from the spring. Okay, so that banded structure is related to the temperature, but the reason it's banded is because at very specific temperatures, very specific uh, types of algae uh, find them uh, 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 comfortable environments to live in. Okay, and so you get this very pretty rainbow color uh, that we uh, all have uh, uh, learn to associate with the uh, normal spectrum of the rainbow, okay? People's reactions to this when you've never seen the Grand Prismatic Spring is often to think that it's Photoshop, but it absolutely is not. This is what it looks like. It's really quite remarkable and really, it's, it's my favorite feature in Yellowstone. So if you ever get to go to Yellowstone, I highly recommend it. 
Okay, so organisms do this all over the place, and we've, we've known about it for a long time. We've known about the brine shrimp, we've known about the grand progenic spring, right? We've known that there are organisms that live in environments for a long, long time. But what we've discovered slowly over the last few decades is that virtually everywhere we look on Earth, we find there are uh, organisms living in the extreme environments no matter what they are. Okay, so to quote uh, Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park, life finds a way and it really does seem to be true no matter what environment we we find on earth life apparently finds a way to live there okay with the exception as i note there at the bottom of the page of hot lava so uh you know people speculate about this you can go read all kinds of papers about can things live in hot lava uh but right now the the uh uh, structure of organic organisms as we understand them cannot survive the intense heat of hot lava, okay? It can survive pretty hot places, right? So the Grand Prismatic Spring is a good example, uh, but the hot lava is just a little too much for all the organics that we've ever seen, so. Okay, so basically life does two things to live in extreme environments, or one of two things. It either develops special methods to deal with the environment, Okay, so that's the that's the basically what the brine shrimp did, right? The brine shrimp developed ways to deal with the salt. They didn't utilize the salt; they just figured out how to deal with it. Okay, so that's that's dealing with your environment. And then the other special things they could do is they can exploit the environment for energy. Okay, and this often is like what the cyanobacteria are doing here in the Grand Prismatic Spring. Um, they're certainly photosynthetic; they use light from the sun. But uh, when you encounter uh, creatures that live in extreme environments like uh, hot springs, often they're using the heat from the hot spring itself as their source of external energy. And we'll we'll give you another example of that in just a minute. Okay, so in general, when encountering extreme environments, we do sometimes see macroscopic organisms like the brine shrimp. Okay, but the microbes are extremely good at adapting to living in the um, uh, in the extreme environments. Um, their ability to go through experimental generations over and over and over again until eventually they find one that sticks seems to be the thing that allows them to do that. So there are long, long lists of the different extreme environments that you can encounter, and you can look up names for all of these, uh, as we call them, extremophiles. But here are a few of the common ones that you encounter. Thermophiles like extreme temperatures, acidophiles like high acidity, alkophiles, high basic, halophiles like salt, barophiles like high pressure. Uh, and osmophiles like high sugar environments, okay? So, so those are kind of the ones that we talk about. And so when we start talking about extreme places in the solar system, we will come back to some of these extremophiles and say, maybe it's, you know, halophiles that could live in this environment or whatever we may be thinking about, okay? So let me give you one last example of an extremophile. So uh, these are extremophiles that we've only known about uh, now for about, well, I guess it's 40 years, uh, but certainly in my lifetime, these were discovered when I was in grade school. Uh, so in 1979, in the deep Pacific, uh, we discovered the first hydrothermal vents. So these are not unlike the thermal features in Yellowstone. They're places where material from uh, under the ground is coming up. Uh, in the case of the volcanic vents in the ocean, uh, they're bringing up a very uh, hot material. Um, it's very rich in uh, iron sulfides and other exotic uh, chemicals that aren't the normal ones you find in the uh, ocean water. It comes up through the surface to the ocean water and that sudden heat plus cold water and then the exotic chemical compounds like the sulfides mixed with the uh, high salinic, uh, 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 high saline content of the water causes precipitants to form. So those of you who've been in chemistry, remember your chemistry, know that sometimes when you mix chemicals together, solids drop out. Okay, and that formation of those precipitants is churning because of the hot water and bubbling away. Um, and so what you get is something that looks not unlike smoke. Okay, so these are often called black smokers. Now, uh, these are extremely high pressure environments. They're down in the deepest parts of the ocean. You can find them in all the oceans of the world. So along the mid-Atlantic Ridge where the plates are falling apart, uh, in the Pacific along the Ring of Fire and so on. Uh, the water's very hot because it's geothermal. It's coming up from uh, underneath um, and it's very acidic. So that, uh, those reactions with the iron sulfides uh, produce things like hydrogen sulfides, sulfuric acid. And so the uh, water, the area around these black smokers is usually very, very highly acidic. 
And once we found them, we saw pictures immediately uh, and saw things like what you see here, which is the black smoker smoking away. We could uh, certainly measure the properties of the water, but there is a gigantic colony, these are called tube worms, growing around the black smoker. And there are other macroscopic creatures. There's a whole ecosystem of crabs and cephalopods and all kinds of stuff that feed on each other around this area. But the tube worms grow directly on the event. Uh, and you'll see there uh, that they're growing. Uh, it's probably hard to see in some of these pictures, but they're growing on a microbial mat. Okay, so that mat is a mat of uh, archaea. And the archaea are very specialized archaea. So this is deep down in the ocean. Uh, there's no sunlight, so they can't get uh, energy by photosynthesis. And so they use what's called chemosynthesis. So they basically use energy provided by breaking down the, the uh, hydrogen sulfide compounds uh, to break down the organic components of things like carbon dioxide and methane uh, that they use for the raw materials to carry on their life and processes. The tube worms actually have some of these archaea inside them. They don't have a normal uh, intestinal system, uh, despite calling them worms. Uh, their, their track uh, basically is populated with these uh, archaea. And so when the archaea go through their chemosynthesis, uh, their waste products are what the tube worms use for nutrients, okay? So the extreme adapt adaptations here are multifold. Right? So the bacteria learned how to deal and extract energy from the environment. The tube worms basically learned how to extract energy from the, uh, from the uh, bacteria. And so they uh, live in this kind of mutually symbiotic environment now. Okay? Uh, and then I said there's other normal critters that uh, build uh, on that lower part of the food chain to form a normal, what you and I might call a predator-prey ecosystem. Okay, so this is uh, down on the bottom of the ocean. It's a classic example of what we call uh, these extremophile systems. Um, and you can certainly encounter many other places uh, on planet Earth uh, where we see similar extreme environments where life has come in and filled niches. Very often it, build, it uh, builds small ecosystems just like the ones we talked about there, uh, where it's self-contained and the ecosystem uh, kind of built on itself the way we see in other places. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, extremophiles right now. We're going to talk a little bit about this in the context of uh, um, uh, living in outer space here uh, for the second half of the lecture, um, and then next week we'll full-blown jump out to the solar system. Okay, so I hope you're all having a good day. I will talk to you soon.